minimum of justification or argument. 1.13. The facts in logical space are the world. 1.2. The world divides into facts. The book's conclusion is even more memorable. 7. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence. Few others have altered the course of philosophy in quite so striking a fashion. Such succinct perspicacity is surpassed only by Socrates, Know thyself, Descartes, I think therefore I am, and Nietzsche, God is dead. In those parts where it is not too technical, in the logical sense, Wittgenstein's Tractatus is the most exciting work of philosophy ever written. Its clarity and daring leaps of argument make it at times almost poetic, as do many of its conclusions, and its basic idea is simple to grasp. The Tractatus is an attempt to delineate what we can talk about in a meaningful manner. This leads to the question, what is language? Wittgenstein claims that language gives us a picture of the world. This idea had been inspired by a newspaper report he had read about a court case in which model cars had been used to represent an accident. The model cars were like language describing the actual state of affairs. They pictured what had happened, but most important, they shared the same logical form. They both obeyed the rules of logic. The model cars, language, could also be used to describe all possibilities, near-miss, traffic jam, absence of car that was alleged to have caused the accident, and so forth, but they could not describe two cars occupying the same space at once, or one car occupying two separate spaces at once. Logical form prevented this, both in reality and in language. When it is analysed down to its atomic propositions, language consists of pictures of reality. In this way, Propositions can represent the whole of reality, all facts, because propositions and reality have the same logical form. They cannot be illogical. The limits of language are the limits of thought, because this too cannot be illogical. We cannot go beyond language, for to do so would be to go beyond the limits of logical possibility. The logical propositions of language are a picture of the world and can be nothing else. They can say nothing about anything else. This means that certain things simply cannot be said. Unfortunately, the assertions in the Tractatus fall into this category. These assertions are not pictures of the world. Wittgenstein realized this. In trying to overcome this difficulty, he clung to his earlier idea that although certain things cannot be said to be true, they can be shown to be true. He admitted that in the Tractatus he was trying to say what can in fact only be shown, but he concludes the Tractatus with his celebrated magisterial pronouncement which forbids others from trying the same. What we cannot speak about we must pass over in silence. Inevitably God falls into this category of things that cannot be spoken about. We can't say anything about God because language pictures only reality. Yet Wittgenstein claims that such things as God do exist. It's just that they can't be said or thought. There are, indeed, things that cannot be put into words. They make themselves manifest. They are what is mystical. In common with his writings in his wartime notebooks, the end of the Tractatus is a compelling blend of logic and mysticism, it is very difficult to dismiss this as hocus-pocus, especially when it is expressed with such forceful clarity. Unfortunately, it is not philosophy, though it probably qualifies as philosophic poetry of the highest order. Sadly, there are a number of even more crucial objections to the Tractatus. Admittedly, language and reality certainly have some relation to each other. But how do we know that this relation is in fact logical form? Wittgenstein was forced to fudge this issue, though he certainly didn't believe this was what he was doing. Also, the category of things we cannot talk about includes a large number of things that we simply must talk about if we are to continue living in a civilized fashion. For a start, we can't talk about good and evil, or even right and wrong. 
Likewise, the language of art also falls into this category, for it is in essence illogical. In being metaphorical, a work of art is both itself and something else, and to say of a work of art that what it expresses is inexpressible is a contradiction. Even Wittgenstein would find it difficult to argue that it doesn't express anything at all. Some have argued that language itself falls into this category. Wittgenstein overcomes this problem by declaring that since logical propositions are tautologous, they do in fact say nothing. This admission would appear to put an end to philosophy as such. Wittgenstein has the good grace, or overweening pride, to point this out in his preface to the Tractatus. Despite these serious objections and the admission of philosophic bankruptcy, the Tractatus was to have a profound influence. In particular, it proved an inspiration to the Vienna Circle, who formulated logical positivism. Philosophy may have come to an end, but it didn't stop the logical positivists from developing this end into a further philosophy of their own. According to them, the meaning of any proposition lies in its manner of verification. There are two meaningful types of propositions. In the first, which are to be found in mathematics and logic, the meaning of the subject is contained in the meaning of the predicate. They are tautologous, and this can be verified by comparing the subject with the predicate. For example, 12 minus 10 is 2. The second type of proposition is verifiable by observation. For example, the ball is rolling down the hill. If you can't verify a statement, it is meaningless. This rules out all metaphysics, which includes theological statements such as God exists. According to Wittgenstein, such a question as Does God exist? is not only incapable of being answered, but incapable of being asked in the first place, as it is meaningless. We simply cannot speak in any meaningful fashion about what isn't tautologous or verifiable by observation. Yet unlike the logical positivists, Wittgenstein continued to believe in God, even if it was impossible to speak about him. Wittgenstein's concluding remark, what we cannot speak about we must pass over in silence, also presents a problem. If it is impossible to speak about a thing in a meaningful manner, we must keep quiet about it. God, ethics, aesthetics, identifying the winner of the Kentucky Derby before the race, are all consigned to silence. Unfortunately, such statements as, what we cannot speak about we must pass over in silence, also fall into the same category. But Wittgenstein didn't consider this to be a fatal flaw in his argument. Wittgenstein put the finishing touches to the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus while being held under conditions of extreme privation in an Italian prisoner-of-war camp at Cassino. From here he managed to make contact with Russell, and eventually the Tractatus was published with a preface by Russell. This preface outraged and disillusioned Wittgenstein because he considered that it showed Russell hadn't understood his book. Wittgenstein insisted upon including his own introduction as a corrective. In this he modestly points out that his work contains the unassailable and definitive truth, the final solution of the problems of philosophy. He does have the good grace to admit how little is achieved when these problems are solved. Having put an end to philosophy, Wittgenstein quite logically saw no point in continuing with this subject. When he returned home to Austria after the war, he began looking around for another field of endeavour. He thought of entering a monastery, but considered the monk who greeted him at the gate offensively rude, so he abandoned the idea and took up working as a gardener on the monastery grounds. He was determined to lead the life of a saint even if his philosophy had denied the meaningful existence of saints, rendering them unspeakable. In fact, Wittgenstein was once again a deeply troubled man. In the extremes of war he had undergone a form of religious conversion, and now believed in living a simple, spiritual life, similar to that preached by Tolstoy during his last years. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was in ruins, and Austria itself was bankrupt both spiritually and financially. But on the instructions of Karl Wittgenstein before he died, the family fortune had been reinvested in America. 
To his son Ludwig's irritation, this meant that he was now even richer than he had been before the war, when he had tried to give away his inheritance. In between hoeing the monastery garden, Wittgenstein visited Vienna to make sure that this time the family lawyer followed his instructions to the letter and gave away all his inherited fortune. This took some time, as the lawyer at first found his instructions impossible to believe, and then was astonished by how much he was expected to get rid of. Eventually, he managed to pass on most of it to Wittgenstein's sisters, who had no wish to see more of the family fortune frittered away on donations to other worldly or alcoholic poets. Having got rid of philosophy and his inherited millions, Wittgenstein decided to become a schoolteacher in a remote mountain village in Lower Austria. After turning down one village because it had a pleasant little park with a fountain, this is not for me, I want an entirely rural spot, he happened upon the poor village of Trattenbach. Wittgenstein's sojourn here was a catastrophe for all concerned. The aristocratic saint began inflicting his impossible principles upon the peasant children, whose parents were outraged. They needed no teaching about poverty and simplicity. The God-fearing villagers were equally outraged when the resident saint refused to attend church because he thought the sermons spiritually vacuous and they were even more put out when he refused to join them for a drink in the local beerstube, instead choosing to remain upstairs in his bare room playing the clarinet and contemplating suicide. After a couple of years things came to a head. In an incident at the school, Wittgenstein struck a child. This was blown up out of all proportion, and the villagers managed to rid themselves of their philosophically impossible saint. Wittgenstein returned to Vienna, where his family became seriously worried about his mental condition. One of his sisters commissioned him to build a new house for her, and he took on the task with characteristic earnestness, designing a modern block-like building utterly devoid of ornamentation. But this was to be no simple construction. Each element of the design had to be fulfilled with fanatical exactitude. An entire wall was knocked down when a window was found to be a few centimetres out of place, each door-handle had to be specially made, the window-latches were discovered to be aesthetically unacceptable, and so on. The builders were driven to distraction by their perfectionist taskmaster, but they couldn't afford to leave the employ of this lunatic, who was building his millionaire's sister a three-story modern residential prison, because out on the streets of Vienna people were starving. This house still stands on Kundbangasse, a street close to the Danube Canal in an eastern district of Vienna. In appearance, the building is rather unexceptional, early twentieth-century modernist block three stories high, with rows of large plain windows. When I first located the Wittgenstein house several years ago, I was informed that it was not open to the public. Disappointedly, I stood in the street trying to peer up through the windows in an attempt to see what it looked like inside. Through one of the windows I noticed a staircase, which crossed it diagonally. After a few moments I quickly turned away. A woman had begun ascending the staircase, and I found myself gazing up under her skirt. This structural howler had evidently been overlooked by the architect amidst his obsession with precisely positioned and impeccably designed light switches and the like. This book is continued on Disc 2. Wittgenstein in Ninety Minutes by Paul Strathern Continued Disc 2 A woman had begun ascending the staircase, and I found myself gazing up under her skirt. This structural howler had evidently been overlooked by the architect amidst his obsession with precisely positioned and impeccably designed light switches and the like. In a striking parallel, Wittgenstein's second philosophy, which must have been forming in his mind at the time, shows remarkably similar characteristics in its obsession with detail and complete disregard for the requirements of the people who are expected to live with it. At the same time Wittgenstein was building this house for his sister, he regularly met with members of the Vienna Circle. This discussion group contained some of the finest minds in Central Europe, including the philosopher Schlick, who was later shot by a student disappointed with his exam results, and the logician Carnap, 
who came to believe that all philosophical problems would be solved if we would all speak Esperanto. The members of the Vienna Circle were in the process of developing the ideas in Wittgenstein's Tractatus into the virulent anti-metaphysics of logical positivism. They were astounded to find that Wittgenstein himself was a deep 